their heart and their life to God's Holy Spirit and allow Him to guide them so they may bear great fruit. Most of the missionaries I have met or read about, and I'm sure you've known many missionaries also, are not super men and women, gifted with every charism and strong in every sense of the word. They're often humble servants, accomplishing their daily lives without the glitter of stage lights and recognition. They've been touched by the Lord's love and mercy and cannot live without sharing this experience with their brothers and sisters, especially with those who are most in need. Missionary disciples have two very distinctive characteristics. They are in love with Jesus Christ. He is the center of their life. And they love humanity and want to share that love with all those they meet. The two characteristics of a missionary disciples. I often reflect on this verse from the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God looked on this world with love. <coughs> with love. And he sent his Son to save us, to reveal that love. When you and me are sent out to this world, it is out of love. If we don't love the world, meaning if we don't love the people in this world today, we will never be able to evangelize them and bring them to Christ and His church. That's why I'm always very reluctant when I hear these pseudo missionaries who only have negative, negative, negative things to say about people. They look outside and they only see death, negativism. Everything is awful. Everything's going to hell. Of course we need to have a lucid way of looking at things and we see what's, what's wrong. But we also see that that is the word that the world that God loves. Those are the people that God loves. I need to love them if I want them to come to the light and come to the one who is the light. If you don't love them, you're not going to go out there with the right attitude. We are very lucid and can see how broken our world is in so many aspects. But that does not allow us to condemn or look down with disgust on people. Jesus taught us to look up to people with respect, to enter into a relationship and dialogue with them. That is what happens and that is what opens up the heart and allows the good news to enter and transform, convert and renew. We have so many examples of this in the Gospel. Remember when Jesus went down to Jericho and met up with Zacchaeus? The little man, Zacchaeus. Not just in stature, but also the little man as justice went. St. Luke writes, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. <coughs> Jesus looked up. Of course, you can see he had to look up. He was up in the tree on the list. It's <laughs> just normal. Yeah. <coughs> Jesus looked up to Zacchaeus as to make him understand that he was loved. He too is a son of Abraham, a son of God, called to be holy and just. Jesus, have you noticed, never looks down on sinners to make them feel humiliated. On the contrary, he lifts them up 
and make sure they know that his hand is outstretched to welcome them and invite them to new life. When in 2014, we celebrated the 350th anniversary of the first parish in Canada, which is our parish cathedral, our, pa our cathedral parish, Notre Dame de Quebec, we asked the Holy See for the permission to open on the side of our cathedral a holy door, a bronze door like the ones they have in Rome, of course, much smaller, not as impressive, but to uh, invite people to come and experience and we had different artists uh, suggest things. I said, I want a welcoming Jesus. And the artist made this. This is a representation of that door. Jesus with outstretched arms, just like this. So life size. So when you come to the door, he's there. When they showed us the, uh, the, uh, the maquette, what's that in English? The yeah, the little room, yeah, the little example of what he was going to do in bronze. I said to the artist, is there a way that his right hand can come out a little more, out of the door? He says, why do you want to do that? Well, so people will know that Jesus' hands is outstretched and they can grab it. The other people of the committee said, okay, well, if you can do that, and he did. On the day that I blessed that door, I was kneeling on the threshold and blessed that door. I was eye to eye with Jesus' hand, outstretched hand. And in my heart, I said to the Lord, You know, Lord, I'm probably, I'm almost sure that a lot of people will want to hold your hand, grab your hand. When they do, you bring him in, okay? <laughs> Pull him in. Pull him in so they can experience what the church is all about. And we'll be there. We'll have people there. Lay people, priests, welcoming, accompanying, and helping them experience what it is to meet you. All through the year, Hundreds of thousands of people came through. Some quickly, others just taking photos. You know how people are today with phones on? And others really taking time. Most people grab Jesus' hand and experience there a time of encounter that brought them in to the Lord. We had confessors there every day, more than one. They were always busy. People telling their stories. People saying, I've been away from so long. Oh, that Jesus who welcomes me. It makes me feel that I'm wanted. He was waiting for me. You know how bronze is when you touch it many times. It changes color. Boy, Jesus' hand was always warm. And very bright. Jesus looks up to us. He wants to reveal us our true identity, that we are children of God. And a missionary, and a missionary disciple is what he does. He spends his life meeting people, looking up to people, not down on people, and revealing that they are worth living, that their life is precious, they're unique. Even though we belong to Christ and are probably well versed in biblical studies, moral theology, that our lives are somewhat organized as Christians, that does not give us the permission to look down on people and judge them or condemn them. Our attitude must be one of welcoming, accompanying those we want to evangelize. That requires humility on our part. And we must never forget that we have ourselves come a long way. Do you remember the day that you were welcomed by the Lord? That he forgave your sins? That he put you back on your feet? It wouldn't have been a good idea to hit you on the head when you came with your problems. It wouldn't have been a good idea to make you feel judged and looked down upon when you were struggling in your life. We must remember that when we 
go out in today's world to evangelize. The Lord was patient with us. We need to be patient and caring for others. We must believe that in front of me is a brother and a sister, child of God, called like me, a beautiful relationship with the Lord, a fulfilled life. Blessed Pope Paul VI wrote in 1975 what is still known today as the Charter of Evangelization, an apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Nunciandi, which is evangelization in the modern world. It remains one of the fundamental documents for us who want to evangelize gives us very good tips on how to be a missionary in today's world. I'd like to go over a few of those. They're from 1975, but they're very, very of this day and up to, up to par on what we need to be and become. Paul VI, blessed Paul VI, will probably be canonized this year, Pope Francis said. <coughs> starts by saying, above all, the gospel might be pro must be proclaimed by witness. Take a Christian or a handful of Christians who in the midst of their own community show their capacity for understanding and acceptance, their sharing of life and destiny with other people, their solidarity with the efforts of all for what matters, for whatever is noble and good. Let us suppose that in addition, they radiate in an altogether simple and unaffected way of their faith in values that go beyond the current values and their hope in something that is not seen and that one could not dare to imagine. Through this worldless, worldless witness, these Christians stir up irresistible questions in the hearts of those who see how they live. Why are they like this? Why do they live in this way? Who or what is it that inspires them? What are they in our midst? Such a witness is already a silent proclamation of the good news and a very powerful and effective one. Here we have an initial act of evangelization. The above questions will ask whether they are people to whom Christ has never been proclaimed or baptized people who do not practice, or people who live as nominal Christians, but according to principles that are in no way Christian, or people who are seeking and not without suffering, something or someone whom they sense but cannot name. Other questions will arise, deeper and more demanding ones. Questions evoked by this witness, which involves presence, sharing, solidarity, and which is an essential element and generally, the first one in evangelization. The power of witnessing. Last Sunday, first Sunday of Lent, as in all dioceses, is the day that we receive those who are preparing for baptism during the Easter Vigil. The catechumens who've been all year in the process of preparing themselves for baptism. This year in our cathedral, we had 27 adults from the five continents, from all over the world, some Quebecers and people from other countries. And every one of those catechumens is presented either by their pastor or someone who's been accompanying them in their parish. I was very surprised to hear the pastors or the people presenting them, for quite a few of them say, they have come to baptism, Your Eminence, because they have met with someone in their life who was a testimony, who was living their faith and it draw them to ask questions. I think at least three were able to name this person, this nun, this co-worker of mine 
someone in an insurance company says, one of my co-workers, uh, you just, I couldn't believe how this man was living in the midst of all this turmoil and all these, all this production and charts and everything. He was so human and so loving and so caring. He says, what makes you tick? What's happening here? And he shared his faith. It brought him to want to become a Christian. The power of witnessing. Today, in today's world, where we're at now in our Western civilization, we need more than ever that every one of us, you and me, are conscious of that responsibility, of that duty. When people see us live and work and play and socialize and be in sports and shop, and drive on 401. <laughs> Did they meet up with a Christian? That's a great question. Proclaiming the gospel by witness. St. Francis used to say, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. I love that line. <laughs> Are you preaching the gospel at all times? Huh? We think of somebody with a Bible under his arm here going around in street corners and preaching. No, no. Is your life witnessing, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you were arrested for being a Christian, would they find enough evidence to condemn you? And blessed Pope Paul VI continues, Nevertheless, this always remains insufficient, the witnessing, because even the finest witness will prove ineffective in the long run if it is not explained, justified, what Peter called always having your answer ready for people who ask, who ask you the reason for the hope that you all have, and made explicit, by a clear and unequivocal proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The good news proclaimed by the witness of life sooner or later has to be proclaimed by the word of life. There is no true evangeliz evangelization if the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom, and the mystery of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, are not proclaimed. The history of the church from the discourse of Peter on the morning of Pentecost onwards has been intermingled and in identified with the history of this proclamation. What we call the heart, the heart of our faith, the kerygma, the death and resurrection of our, of our Lord. The heart of our faith is what we need to proclaim. Pope Paul VI continues, at every new phase of human history, the church, constantly gripped by the desire to evangelize, has but one preoccupation, whom to send to proclaim the mystery of Jesus. In what way is this mystery to be proclaimed? How can one ensure that it will resound and reach all those who should hear it? And so, my friends, how are you a missionary in your daily life? By witness, hopefully, the people who see you and live, the people who see you live, are able to detect that there is something different about you. Your openness to others, your readiness to forgive, your attentiveness to defend the poor, the outcast, those who are suffering and isolated. But do you ever proclaim the gospel by word? How do you use the word of God in being a missionary? You know, for many Catholics, this is what happens. They have a Bible at home, but they have to pick it up every year and go, <laughs> get the dust <laughs> off of it. Did you know that the Bible is still this year the best-selling book in the world. Did you know that? Yes. They, they took it off the charts because it would always be at the top. 
The best selling